Young. Hi, today we're with uh, Ray Youngen, author and researcher, and he's going to tell us something about the uh, uh, Korean conspiracy, it's called by various names, uh, or the New Age movement. So Ray, uh, can you give us an introduction to it, please? Yeah, I, uh, I began researching this movement back in uh, uh, mid-1980s, about 1984, and this book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, was uh, in this book, The Aquarian Conspiracy was uh, uh, very popular at the time, and it was uh, showing how uh, various uh, spiritual approaches that had been somewhat uh, obscure or novel before were becoming mainstream. Now, the woman that, uh, that wrote this book was named uh, Marilyn Ferguson. And I want to share some uh, information on how this came about. Marilyn Ferguson uh, got into transcendental meditation in uh, the 1970s through her brother. She had, uh, I think, migraine headaches. Okay. And her brother had uh, been involved with transcendental meditation, or TM as it's called. And it suggested maybe this would help her, uh, her headaches. So she got into it, and she became, uh, um, you know, spiritually attuned to, you know, New Age, um, you know, ideologies through it. So she began this, in 1975, she began publishing this uh, monthly newsletter, or twice monthly newsletter, called Brain Mind Bulletin. And this was on, as she put it, states of consciousness, meditation, and related subjects. So she uh, was putting out a, a booklet, or a, I mean, I'm sorry, a, a um, newsletter on New Age spirituality and how it was impacting. And she said that uh, uh, rapidly growing numbers of people were exploring, you know, new territory. As I traveled around the country lecturing and covering conferences, I found these pioneers everywhere. And the new perspectives were being put to work. The social activism of the 1960s and the consciousness revolution of the early 1970s seemed to be moving toward a historic synthesis. Social transformation resulting from personal transformation changed from the inside out. So what she was saying is people who wanted to, the activists, social activists from the 1960s, instead of uh, merely going out and protesting, were starting to... Uh, combine this with, uh, you know, Eastern-type mysticism. She said that uh, it suddenly struck me that in their sharing of strategies, their linkage and their recognition of each other by subtle signals, the participants were not merely cooperating with one another, they were in collusion. This movement, it, this movement, was a conspiracy. And then she goes on to say that, you know, the word conspiracy normally has negative associations. But she said this conspiracy was, was a positive one. It was a benign one. She said, conspire in its literal sense means to breathe together. It is an intimate joining. And she chose the word Aquarian because, you know, this was connected with the astrological age of Aquarius, that we were entering a millennium of love and light. And she, uh, basically, this Aquarian conspiracy was what many would call, you know, the New Age movement. And that's what I began to, uh, to look at. I began to uh, um, uh, study this movement. And she says, the conspirators are linked, made kindred by their inner discoveries. So, over the last 31 years, I have watched this movement go from being relatively obscure to being very, very uh, pervasive in Western society. A um, good example is um, when I first started to research uh, in 1984, uh, there, was, uh, ver there were very few books on this available to the general public. I remember uh, when one would go into uh, the mall, uh, chain mall bookstores, uh, B. Dalton, was one, you would only find five shelves devoted to this type of thing. 
And then another 10, 15 years later, in the late 90s, there was a uh, bookstore chain called Borders. And it had actually mushroomed to 65 shelves. So it went from fi uh, 5 shelves to 65 shelves, just in, you know, uh, 10, 12 years or so. So that is an incredible amount of time. And uh, also, it was the nature uh, of, uh, of where these books were. Like, uh, for instance, this is being, uh, the audience should, or the people listening should know that this is being filmed in Canada, Vancouver, British Columbia. And a few days ago, uh, remember you and, or uh, no, it was Eddie and I went to uh, uh, the uh, Metro Town Mall, which is the big mall here in Vancouver. And we went to Chapters, which is the you know national bookstore chain of Canada. And of course, there was a New Age section, and uh, you know you had books like on Wicca, witchcraft, you know psychic powers, that type of thing. That was about 17 shelves. But there was another shelf, I mean another section called Well-Being, and that was 25 shelves, you know, somewhat bigger than the New Age section and in that area were mostly New Age books. That was the real New Age section, was this section devoted uh, to what's called well-being. That's where you found The Secret, that's where you found Louise Hayes books, I mean mainstream New Age spirituality was represented in this section called well-being. There was even um, books by the former Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh who now goes by the name of Osho and there was like practically a whole shelf just devoted to him. And this is where people go to, um, you know, find answers to their problems. Incidentally, the Christian section was 20 shelves. So the well-being section was, you know, five shelves larger than the Christian section. So you put the New Age section and this section together, it came to, uh, you know, something like uh, 40, 43 shelves, I believe it was, 42, 43 shelves. So we're looking at a really large interest here still, you know, 30 some years after, 35 years after Marilyn Ferguson wrote this book. And there's individuals who can back this up. This is a book called The Making of the New Spirituality, uh, The Eclipse of the Western Religious Tradition by James A. Herrick. And he makes it uh, clear that this is not just a conspiracy theory. Neo-paganism, the paranormal, astrology, nature, religion, holistic thinking, healing, new age, new spirituality. A massive shift in Western religious attitudes has taken place, almost without our noticing it. And that's why we're making this film here, because we want to make it clear to people that this is something they can't ignore. The Judeo-Christian tradition of Western culture has slowly, but steadily, been eclipsed by a new way of viewing spirituality. And you can really see that, I'm glad he said uh, Western, you can really see that in Europe. Uh, last summer I was in uh, Great Britain, Ireland, and Germany. And uh, these, you know, Western Europe is known for being secular, right? You know, church attendance is very low and uh, you know, most people that follow the culture there talk about how uh, secular uh, Western Europe is. Now, it may be secular, but it is not a uh, void of spirituality. Again, I, uh, I went to... Um, you can really find out uh, the popularity of these things by uh, what's called the law of the market, you know, supply and demand. So I went to uh, the chain, national chain bookstores in, um, you know, Great Britain and Ireland. I went to Dublin and Birmingham, and the national uh, bookstore chain there is called uh, Waterstone. It's the equivalent of what Borders was here, and, you know, Barnes & Noble still is. So I went to, uh, uh, well, I was staying in the Cork area, and I went to the one there, and that, you know, was... Uh, the same as in the U.S. So I went to the one in Dublin, and they had uh, some 40-some uh, shelves that said Body, Mind, Spirit. That's what New Age Spirituality is known as in uh, 
in uh, England and Ireland is body, mind, spirit. So they had 40-some shells devoted to that. Well, actually, there was a section called uh, the occult. Then there was astrology, and then it said there were a uh, big area that said body, mind, spirit. Then there was a big area that was the equivalent of, you know, self-help or well-being that I just mentioned, in, you know, at chapters. And again, that was predominantly New Age books. And then there was like alternative health, a lot of which was connected with what's called energy healing. And then there was Eastern religion, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, that type of thing. So altogether, there were um, 80 shelves at the Waterstone Bookstore in Dublin. But the one that really was uh, pervasive was the uh, one in Birmingham, which is England's second largest city. Um, it was like a really high rise. I think there was four or five stories or so. They had an ele uh, elevator. It was so big. And... Uh, uh, again, you know, body, mind, spirit, and then they had one called spiritual living, and that's where you found uh, the same kind of books. In fact, they had Madame Blavatsky's A Secret Doctrine in Spiritual Living, and then again, you know, self-help and alternative uh, medicine, and uh, actually there were 88 shells, or no, 100 shells devoted to New Age spirituality there. And then in Dusseldorf, Germany, I went to the bookstore there, and that's where there were 88 shelves devoted to, you know, New Age spirituality. Uh, books on Christianity hardly existed in the one in Dusseldorf. The overriding spiritual view in, uh, in, in, in that one in Dusseldorf was uh, what Marilyn Ferguson was talking about, the Aquarian Conspiracy, uh, you know, metaphysics. So... It seems, you know, and anyone can uh, check this out, you know, this is something that can be verified. All you have to do is email Waterstone Books in, uh, in Birmingham or Dublin. Or if you know someone, if you speak German or know someone who speaks German, you can find the one in uh, central Dusseldorf. And they would verify that, you know, uh, oh, by the way, in... Uh, in Dusseldorf, it does, it's not called New Age, it's called the Esoteric, which is another term for the occult. You know, the Esoteric. And, you know, totally, like I said, 88 shells devoted these subjects. Uh, 35 years after Marilyn Ferguson wrote her book. So, um, you know, it's, it, this is something that can be verified, you know. Um, but, so we were talking about secular. If, how can a... a a um, society be secular and still be permeated with uh, uh, basically something that most people would perceive as being uh, religious, right? Well, you've heard the term spiritual but not religious. Well, there's actually a book uh, by that name, Spiritual But Not Religious, see? <laughs> this is written by Professor uh, Understanding Unchurched America. And this is, you know, written about America, but this uh, could also be, uh, um, you know, written about any uh, Western country. You know, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain. And in it, he says that, um, uh, that what he calls seeker spirituality is gradually altering the American religious landscape. He says over the past decade bookstores have emerged as the most important centers of unchurched spirituality. And he says that uh, these large national chains such as Borders and Barnes and & Noble function as virtual synagogues of spiritual instruction. These stores have large sections labeled Bible, Christianity, and Judaica that offer publications uh, on those subjects. Along them, alongside them now are even larger sections devoted to books on Eastern religions, New Age religion, and self-help philosophies. He says the boundaries of American religion are clearly being redrawn. The suppliers of unchurched spirituality are no longer seen as addressing a small group of kooks who just don't fit into respectable American society. Moreover, this new eclecticism also shapes the personal piety of many who attend our nation's established churches. So, no, so not only are large millions and millions of people spiritual but not religious, 
but even the ones that are attending churches, you know, churchgoers, are being impacted by the spiritual climate because of, uh, of you know, the popularity of, uh, of this subject. Um, here in Vancouver, there's a lot of people getting involved with yoga and various forms of meditation. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the role of meditation uh, in this. Uh, is meditation a way to open oneself up uh, to, to whatever uh, is transformative in this movement? Um, maybe you might want to comment on that. Well, meditation is the very essence of what we're dealing with here. We're not really dealing with just somebody who uh, accepts things on the intellectual level. You know, it's not like politics or what have you. Um, let me read some quotes from a couple of New Age books. Um, this one, I believe, is on channeling. You know, I have a number. This is from the book I wrote in the early 90s, uh, From Any Shall Come of My Name. And I uh, had a section on uh, stress management. The meditation was being promoted for stress management, but a lot of people that were getting into it for that didn't realize that there were other uh, uh, side effects to meditation. And this one New Age book said, almost without exception, those who channel effectively meditate regularly. Now, channeling is when you have an entity or spirit guide speaking through you. The process of channeling itself is an extension of the state of meditation. The best way to prepare them for channeling is by meditation. Another book on tarot cards said, Meditation is a technique common to all occult systems. Indeed, the necessity of meditation to enhancement of health, spiritual growth, and understanding is the one and almost the only point upon which all occultists of every type and description can be guaranteed to categorically agree. In other words, all occultists say that, you know, they may disagree on many other things, but meditation is the one thing that they will, you know, are guaranteed to agree on. Now, what is meant by meditation? That's the uh, most important aspect of this, uh, you know, what we're doing right now. What is meditation? Well, I remember back in the late 70s, uh, I'd go into various health food stores and I'd see posters of... Um, you know, of somebody in the lotus position, you know, like this. And it would say, learn meditation or meditation classes. And I thought that what they were doing was just thinking, you know, that to me meditation meant to think deeply upon. That, you know, these people were just pondering their problems and trying to, you know, figure out discursively how to better deal with things. But then, once I... Uh, Began a few years later, 84, when I began learning about, you know, the advent of New Age spirituality, I found out it was something entirely different. In fact, the exact opposite, you know. So what I have here, this is really the cornerstone of uh, our little series here, the Aquarian Conspiracy series. You know, what exactly is meditation and what does it do? Okay, this is a booklet put out by the Rosicrucians, which is, you know, kind of a esoteric society. In fact, the, um, on the front covers here it says Esoteric Essays, Meditation, It's Technique. And this is what defines New Age Meditation. This is very important that people listening to this, if they don't know this, that they, uh, they pay very close attention. And I'd like your comments, too, after I'm through here. An Eastern form of meditation relates three essential stages. The first one is the stage of purgation. Now, what does that mean, purgation? This consists of attempting to dismiss from mind all thought to be receptive. You dismiss all thought from your mind. 
The mystic refers to this stage as entering the silence. It means not just physical silence, that is, the avoidance of extraneous sounds, but mental silence. You know, you're not involved in normal thinking. And this is done through basically focusing on something that uh, uh, can be either a mantra, a, a word, or a, a sound, like your breath, or it can be a percussion sound, but you focus on something, you don't think about it, you don't think about the mantra. And the mantra can be anything, you know, it can be you are my Lord, it can be, you know, praise Jesus. But you say it for like 20 minutes, and you just focus on it, and that means that you cannot have uh, a normal thought flow, you know, stop the interior dialogue is uh, what New Agers say. So you purge the mind of thought. A lot of people say that you empty your mind, but I, I don't really, it, that's not really the right term, emptying the mind. It just means, what we're dealing with here means to stop your normal flow of thought. You're always thinking about something, even when you don't think you are, you still are. You're observing things around you and there's like a, you know, the mind is active all the time, but when you focus on your breath or the mantra or whatever, then you can't think in the normal sense. So that is what is the first step. And then it gets somewhat interesting. The second stage is said to be the stage of illumination. It is when the individual senses contact with the transcendental source of knowledge. It is a kind of cosmic consciousness, the ascent of awareness to an enlarged and all-embracing state of consciousness. Now that term cosmic consciousness, I, I kind of hate to use that term cosmic because to a lot of people they'll roll their eyes and you know when they think of the word cosmic they think of Buck Rogers and his cosmic ray gun, you know. They think of somebody who like takes LSD, you know, or somebody who's uh, far out or whatever, but the word cosmic just means universal, you know, the cos the Greek word for the universe is the cosmos. So cosmic means that, you know, you're, uh, you're involved in something universal. So the first stage is you uh, stop the normal thinking process. The second stage is, you know, you have this sense of having contact with uh, something transcendent or this realm, this, this, this uh, this hidden supernatural realm. And the third stage, the third and final state, is the noetic stage, which, me which uh, means the infusion of knowledge. You know, so you start getting, you make contact and you start getting knowledge or gnosis from this uh, source. And this is what we're talking about here. Everything that, that uh, we discussed here earlier you know, the well-being section, all that, this, every one of those books contains this process. Every one of them. You know, you can't really be involved in this spirituality without this, this kind of a, a practice. And I have some uh, uh, examples here how this can happen. This uh, uh, book is called The Highest Goal, The Secrets That Sustains You in Every Moment by Michael Ray. Now, Michael Ray is uh, no flake, you know, he uh, was a professor at Stanford University and he taught something called creativity in business. And he uh, explains how he got into this, this uh, course, creativity in business, is based on uh, what I just described, uh, accessing mystical states, you know, Eastern type uh, meditation practices. And this is how he got into it. He, uh, he says, I attended a meditation intensive day at an ashram to support a friend. Now an ashram is a Hindu meditation center. That's what they're known as, ashrams. So he just went as a friend to somebody. Somebody wanted to go to this and he just went along to support him. He says, as I sat in meditation, in what was for me an unfamiliar environment. So he'd never done this before, you know, it was unfamiliar. I suddenly felt, you know, he was meditating as I sat in meditation, so he was doing this process. I suddenly felt and saw a bolt of lightning shoot up from the base of my spine out the top of my head. 
Now that's called kundalini awakening. That in this type of meditation, there's this sense of this energy that surges up the spine, activating what are called chakras. And this is known as the kundalini or serpent power. It forced me to recognize something great within me. That's what was called the, you know, uh, infusion of, you, you sense contact with, uh, you know, some paranormal uh, reality. Um, the problems I had been having and the low opinion I had of myself seemed minuscule in relation to this awareness of my own divinity. So all of a sudden he felt that that's the noetic stage, that's when he starts getting this knowledge that, you know, that he is divine, he is a godlike being. And he says that, uh, then my legs started to vibrate and shake. Their shaking caused me to bounce on the floor in an almost involuntary way. So he literally uh, was impacted by something, you know, beyond himself. Now somebody might say this is just his imagination. This was uh, psychosomatic. And that's one thing I want to bring out right now, that there seems to be a conformity and continuity in this type of experience. That it, everybody that does this seems to come out with the same type of experience and have the same type of procedures that happen. It was just, if it was just their imagination, everybody would have something different occur, right? You know, there'd be a, a wide variety of uh, things happening, but there seems to be, a, like I said, a conformity which means that there is actually something they're coming into contact with. So something is downloaded or they're acquiring some kind of gnosis or knowledge. Uh, how is it changing their worldview? Yeah. One of the books that uh, kind of illustrates what we're trying to get across here is this book called The Law of Attraction, The Basics of the Teachings of Abraham by Jerry, uh, Esther and Jerry Hicks. Now, uh, Esther Hicks was very reluctant to get involved in anything that was occultic. Because in the book she says, the whole idea of a person being in contact with a non-physical being made me extremely uncomfortable. So this is how most people would feel. You know, very uncomfortable with the idea of, of having a non-physical entity uh, you know, connect to them. But she, um, you know, she wanted to grow spiritually, and she had certain advisors who were uh, encouraging her to uh, meditate. And she uh, didn't know what was what that really entailed. Like, what do you mean by meditate? She says, um, um, uh, "I asked, well, what do you mean by med by meditate?" And she was told, uh, for 15 minutes each day, sit in a quiet room, wear comfortable clothing, and focus on your breathing. Now, that doesn't sound too weird, does it? No. Now, notice how this contrasts with, remember earlier I said, I, when I first heard about this, I thought meditate meant to uh, think about things, you know, ponder. Well, that's traditional, med that's traditional Western meditation. What we're dealing with here is those the three steps that I just outlined from the Rosicrucians. So you know, focus on the breathing, you know, either the mantra or the breathing. So this is not the type of meditation the Bible talks about. So anyhow, focus on your breathing, and as your mind wanders, and it will, you know, just start thinking about things, just release the thought and focus back on your breathing. I thought, well, that doesn't sound so weird. In other words, you know, you're just you know, breathing and then just focusing on it. And if you start to get thoughts again, you just bring them back to, you know, your breathing. By the way, this also is the basis of something called uh, mindfulness meditation that's uh, sweeping the country or the world. I saw a lot of books in uh, Europe on mindfulness. It seems to have become a major uh, component of uh, psychology and uh, self-help in, uh, in Europe and also the U.S., but we'll get to that, you know, later on in this series. So she started to do this. She starts to, uh, you know, she set the timer for 15 minutes and started to focus on her breathing. 
Almost immediately, I began to feel a sort of numbness come over me. It was an extremely pleasant sensation. I liked it. You know, she was going into what's called the silence, you know. And uh, her mind was starting to uh, uh, go into alpha states of awareness, you know, which is what the brainwave pattern is when you, when you go into this. Because of the powerful and emotional experience of our very first attempt, we made a decision to set aside 15 or 20 minutes every day to meditate. So she starts doing this, you know, every day for 15 minutes. And then, right before Thanksgiving in 1985, during a period of meditation, I experienced something new. So she was doing the first stage of purgation, and then, right before Thanksgiving, this happened. With the conscious realization that something remarkable was happening, and that something was offering communication to me, intense waves of... of uh, of thrills began to moving all through my body. This is very much like uh, Michael Ray experienced at that ashram. Uh, and she, uh, she um, began to hear this, I am Abraham, I am your spiritual guide, I love you, I am here to work with you. So that's the noetic stage that we just heard about. So she became connected to this uh, Abraham entity, and uh, which he calls infinite intelligence, and it began to flow through her. And this is what Abraham says, there are many of us here. In your physical environment, we are called Abraham, and we know are known as teachers. She's, and they say, there are universal laws that affect everything in the universe. When you have a conscious awareness of these laws and a working understanding of them, your life experience is tremendously enhanced. And she believes, you know, like there is like a common uh, denominator that, that she is connected with her higher self or her soul. And they say only when you consciously understand the relationship between you and your inner being do you have true guidance. And this is the... Um, the essence of what we were seeing there in uh, this, the well-being section of uh, the Chapters Bookstore at the Metro Town Mall. That this is, uh, this is the same type of procedure that they were um, involved with. And this comes to uh, what I'm about to share now that uh, this is the essence of the Aquarian Conspiracy. Again, I have two quotes here from New Age sources. Uh, one is, uh, this isn't me writing this, this is from books taken from New Age sources. Everyone anywhere who tunes into the higher self, that's the realm of, you know, metaphysical realm, becomes part of the transformation. Their lives then become orchestrated from other realms. So in other words, once you connect with the likes of Abraham, you, try, you start trying to get other people involved too. Okay, here's another quote. A woman said, Soon it became apparent that those of us experiencing this inner contact were instinctively and spontaneously drawing together, forming a network. In the many years since, I have watched this network grow and wide to literally encompass the globe. What was once a rare experience, that of meeting another person who admitted to a similar superconscious presence in his or her life, that's one of the terms he used, the superconscious, has now become a common, even frequent event. What I once saw as a personal and individual transformation, I now see as part of a massive and collective human movement. And Gordy, this is what we're talking about here. This Aquarian conspiracy is basically millions of people, huge numbers, who have had the experience of the two individuals I just um, talked about. And now they are trying to get... Uh, as many people as possible, all of humanity involved in a similar uh, condition or a similar encounter. 
So this is what, uh, next we're going to look at some examples of uh, the people who uh, are acquiring conspirators that have had a wide impact. Ray, so far this sounds um, uh, a little ominous, uh, this, this, so, so many people are involved. Uh, is there, you know, is this a cult or does it, is it something that uh, is bigger than a cult? Oh, far bigger than, than cults, uh, not to be confused with the occult, okay. which means hidden or kept secret, and that is a generic reference to many of these practices, but uh, traditionally in our society, uh, the term cult means an aberrant religious group. Yeah, earlier you did mention, though, uh, uh, the use of occult uh, methodologies or uh, disciplines, uh, uh, so the cult is involved, but it's, it's not as... Uh, let's say hidden is what you're saying? Well traditionally yeah the word occult comes from the Latin word occultus which, which means hidden or kept secret. Yeah. And now that, that's the point of these talks we're doing that what was once hidden or kept secret is now being uh, presented on a wide scale to uh, the population at large. And we were uh, discussing, you mentioned uh, cults. This transcends cults. This goes far beyond cults. Um, a cult is more or less an island in society, in the religious landscape. There's different religious groups, you know, and a cult is like one, one grouping or one island, I mean. And, uh, you know, one can um, uh, be attracted to it and join it and then be in it and then leave, you know. So, but what we're talking about is when uh, these practices become widespread throughout mainstream society, you know, in general. What once you would find only in a cult, now you would find anywhere. And this is a perfect example. There was a, a gentleman named John Randolph Price, uh, and he uh, got into this through the American Management Association. Now, no way would you ever consider the American Management Association a cult, right? No. No, I mean, very mainstream, very highly respected. But he says, back when I was in the business world, the American Management Association put out a little book on meditation, which indicated that meditation was a way to attain peace of mind and reduce stress in a corporate environment. So I decided to try it. You know, a simple meditation for stress reduction. I learned that I could go into meditation as a human being and within a matter of minutes have transcended my sense of humanness. I discovered how to come into a new sphere of consciousness. Consciousness actually shifts and you move into a realm you may not have even known existed. So in other words, what he normally would have gotten had he joined uh, like the Theosophical Society or the Hare Krishnas or, uh, you know, the Self-Realization Fellowship, he got through a booklet put out by the American Management Association. The exact same experience, but it was in the context of stress reduction. And that is what the Aquarian Conspiracy uh, entails. All they have to do is to get you to meditate. It's not like the Mormons. Yeah, we saw four Mormon missionaries earlier today, you know, at the mall. And what they do is they uh, approach you and try to convince you intellectually that they have the restored gospel. You know, it's intellectual, it's discursive, it's, uh, you know, based on reasoning. In the Aquarian conspiracy, all they have to do is get you to meditate. And the experience takes over. Uh, there's another quote that metaphys metaphysics can be presented either as religion or pure science without any religious context at all. You know, and that's where it's become the most popular and the most effective is when it's presented as, uh, as science. Francis Schaeffer, a, a Christian philosopher and theologian, uh, mentioned in one of his books, Escape from Reason, Mm -hmm. that he's noticing that our culture is becoming more mystical and he says, it's, it's, he described it as a, a negation of reason uh, to have some kind of um, 
experience, spiritual experience. So this, what you're just describing sounds a lot like this idea that we don't find answers in the area of the rational, uh, involving reason, but it involves some kind of escape or leap into the area of non-reason. Would you agree? Well, uh, <clears throat> yeah, certainly uh, this has nothing to do with, uh, you know, analyzing things and, and coming to a logical conclusions. This is when you, the mind is, the thinking mind is actually switched off. Uh, we're going to look at some examples now of, uh, of what we're talking about. Uh, how this is, you know, John Randolph Price uh, entered this realm. By the way, he went on to become a, a major New Age writer and, and promoted the idea that God was in everybody, that, you know, everyone had the I am presence within them, you know, the I am presence which is God. So he went on to uh, become a full-blown New Age uh, writer. We're going to look at some other books here. This is a book called Maximum Achievement, The Proven System of Strategies and Skills That Will Unlock Your Hidden Powers to Succeed by Brian Tracy. Now Brian Tracy is one of the major uh, motivational speakers in the corporate world. You know, he's not known for being religious. And on the back cover here, he has the endorsement of uh, most of the major uh, uh, motivational speakers that were prominent at, when this book came out. Harvey Mackey, Ken Blanchard, Og Mandino, Dennis Waitley, Wayne Dyer, and Tony Alessandra. All praising this book. So this book is definitely mainstream. So, uh, when you, uh, like he says, you know, uh, maximum achievement, uh, strategies and skills that will unlock your hidden powers to succeed. Not distinctly a religious book, right? Well, chapter six is on the master power. The master power. And Brian Tracy says there's a vast treasure trove of potential that lies deep within each person. And there have been brotherhoods and secret societies uh, throughout the years that, um, um, that knew about the secret orders and knew about these inner powers. And he calls this the superconscious mind. And he says that when you use your superconscious mind correctly, you will be able to solve any problem, overcome any obstacle, and achieve any goal you desire. All personal greatness and individual achievement is based on it. In fact, everything we have discussed up to this point has been pre preparing you to use the powers of your superconscious mind to transform the quality of your life. And then he makes something that's, that's truly astounding. Many of the greatest thinkers who have ever lived have stood in awe before this power and have written about it, calling it many different names. Madame Blavatsky, the Russian theosophist, called it the secret doctrine. So what he's talking about is traditional occultism. Because Madame Blavatsky was uh, the founder of the Theosophical Society, who, uh, which was one of the first New Age organizations to impact the, the Western world, 1875. And then he says Carl Jung called it the collective unconscious, the universal mind, the God mind. And he goes on to explain how uh, this, uh, when you develop the habit of continually turning to your superconscious mind to guide and direct you, to inspire and illuminate you, and to solve every problem on your path, it will work faster and more efficiently every day. And he says that uh, in order to activate this, you have to uh, uh, go into silence, the silence, and that's the uh, what we found in the Rosicrucian thing there. That's the first stage. Uh, he says that uh, uh, when, uh, when you do this, uh, you know, it, uh, it activates and you, and you spring into this superconscious realm. And he says any form of meditation stimulates your superconscious mind and you hear this inner voice. You actually hear an inner voice. And he says, uh, when you do this, you bring yourself into complete alignment with the greatest power of the universe. 
He says, schedule one hour, one solid hour of solitude uh, every day, and during this period of silence, shut everything else out of your mind. You know, there's meditation. And he says, turn everything over to your superconscious mind and release all your cares and worries. Sometime during this hour, your mind will go calm and clear. That's alpha, you know, the alpha state. That's that numbness that uh, um, Esther Hicks talked about. Do what your superconscious has guided you to do. So in other words, you're under control. You're being guided and directed. You're, in other words, you've, you've linked up with this... Uh, same force Madame Blavatsky was linked up to. And he says, if you do this exactly right, you'll never make another mistake. So, the scary thing about this, you know, this, this is not, uh, he's in the front here, he talks about, you know, he, uh, he uh, was fascinated with the subject of happiness, and he studied... Uh, Psychology, philosophy, religion, motivation, personal achievement, and metaphysics. So he got this from metaphysics. But see, he's presenting it not as religion, but as a science. He, uh, he talks about, he has this Phoenix seminar, the psychology of achievement, and uh, he uh, uses this to uh, improve uh, corporations, uh, use this to improve productivity, performance, and output, and uh, people get, or corporations get total quality people, and this system is is being uh, used widely all in all these different countries, uh, scores of different countries. And here's the part that uh, I want to emphasize. Okay, it's clearly this is occultism. You know, this Brian Tracy is teaching classic occultism because Madame Blavatsky was an occultist, and he said this is the power she used. So. Uh, this isn't religion. This isn't a cult. You don't have to join any organization. You don't have to uh, belong to any kind of church. There's no place you have to go to to worship, uh, you know, uh, uh, or sing uh, hymns or songs. You know, Brian, Brian Tracy is not like the Moonies or Scientologists. You know, it's just um, something that he's promoting that people embrace, right? Well, he says... I've taught this system to more than a million people. You know, so what he does is he he preaches meditation, you know, the silence, you know, make your mind go clear, and then you get in touch with the superconscious mind. Well, that's the same thing that Esther Hicks and uh, um, uh, Michael Ray got in contact with. You know, this invisible realm that's out there. But yet it's done within the context of science. You know, the superconscious mind isn't religious, it's science. Okay, there's another, another example is Dr. Dean Ornish, program, Dean Ornish's program for reversing heart disease. Now, when this, uh, this gentleman, uh, this Dr. Ornish spoke in my hometown, uh, something like 400 doctors and nurses went to hear him speak. He spoke at a lecture hall in the basement of the hospital, you know, the local hospital in my community. And there were so many there, they were actually out in the hall. You know, it overflowed. You know, all the seats were taken, and then there was the kind of a area where people stand around, and that was all full, and there were people even out in the hall looking in. It was like 400 people there. So he was extremely well-received. And in the beginning of this book, this book was endorsed by U.S. News and World Report, uh, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, um, Harvard Medical School, uh, uh, the gentleman here says, Dr. Ornish's landmark research validates the advice he provides. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute says Dr. Ornish's program can lead to a better life. USA Today says uh, uh, all the material is good. And uh, the American Journal of Cardiology says Dr. Ornish is on the right road, and we need to get on it also. So, you know, this is the American Journal of Cardiology. These are all mainstream, everything I've read here are mainstream organizations. Right? Well, um, what's so bad about reversing heart disease? Well, the thing is, in the front here, 
under uh, uh, you know the uh, dedication one of the people he dedicates this book to is his guru Swami Satchidananda who helped me to see what is possible and he has a whole in addition to things like nutrition exercise um, things that are actually um, beneficial he incorporates Opening your heart to a higher self. Dr. Ornish is an Aquarian conspirator. And he says the stress management and yoga techniques described in this book are really tools for transformation. He says the essence of God is to be found within. He says that our minds keep us from seeing that everyone and everything is simply God manifesting in different ways. And he says God or our higher force can be experienced. And he talks about Moses, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad all realize the you know God or enlightenment. He says they realize that the higher force or God without is the same as the higher force or God within. You know, in other words, they all talk the same thing. And he has meditation in here. You know, focusing on your breath, the same as all the others. And um, he says. Uh, um, you have to start seeing, we have to start seeing ourselves as an instrument of a higher self or God and treating others as incarnations of God. And he says that when you quiet your mind, when the mind is quiet, you experience your higher self. And then he has how to do it here, focus on your breathing or focus on the sound, you know, religious or secular. And he has uh, video cassettes that help you do this. Uh, and he taught, says this is the time-honored way of focusing the mind to meditate is by repeating a sound over and over. And uh, over here, he says, basically when you do this, he says, God is everywhere and in everything. Everyone and everything is God in disguise in different forms. So basically, this is classic New Age spirituality, but it's couched within... Reversing heart disease. This is what we're talking about. This is the Aquarian conspiracy. Now, from his perspective, this is not something sinister. He's sincere. You know, he actually became a devotee of Swami Satchidananda, you know, Hindu guru, and started meditating and had and hooked up with his quote unquote higher self. And now he's being used to get everybody else hooked up to their higher selves. You know, everything and everybody are simply God in disguise. This is not an intellectual thing that we're uh, talking about here. It's not a philosophy. He is actually, just like the others I've mentioned, he has had the experience of connecting with a supernatural power through meditation. Mm. And that is why he believes everything and everybody are God in disguise. Not because his Swami just told him that intellectually. It's because he has experienced this in a mystical sense, in a mystical state. Now, I'd like to hear your comments on that. Well, uh, I've talked to people that are involved in this movement, and, and it seems like their definition of God is, is sort of pantheistic or monistic, or you know, pantheistic monism. Mm -hmm. uh, that one of the mantras I've heard uh, is, all is one, all is God. Mm -hmm. But when you think about that, uh, uh, there are some philosophical issues with that. You know, if everything is God, well, what's right and wrong? Uh, is, you know, if everybody's God, is Adolf Hitler God? <laughs> you know, we don't have a, a, a basis for uh, saying anything is right or wrong, and even reality or truth uh, it becomes whatever a person perceives it to be. Would you say that is where this is steering? Well, I would say that reality is what the superconscious mind perceives it to be. In other words, the likes of Abraham. Yeah. Uh, uh, what you just described would be what it would be like if everybody, it was just their imagination. Well, but there seems to be a central source that they're connected to. Yeah, this source, whether uh, it's called, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Abraham or Seth or uh, some people. There's claim, many different names. Yeah, they, some people claim they're channeling an E.T., a Deva. Mm -hmm. uh, a, you know. but, but generally it goes under the term the higher self. Yes. But this higher self is also uh, sometimes equivalent to like a spirit guide, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, the higher self manifests as a spirit guide. Yeah, um, I have a friend, um, uh, I knew him since um, high school, mm -hmm. and he got involved with uh, TM, 
mm -hmm. Buddhist meditation and yoga. Yeah. And uh, and anyways, eventually I got an email from him uh, saying that he had a you know, kind of a spiritual experience where he visibly saw an orb of light, mm -hmm. and this orb of light he said came into his body. Mm -hmm. uh, that, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah, that, this isn't intellectual. This is mystical. That's what it sounds like. And uh, this guide started to guide him, and he started to call himself a light worker. Now, the term light worker would that be another name for people involved with this? Movement? Exactly, precisely. And because uh, he said he saw a light, mm -hmm. and uh, the founder of the Subud uh, uh, religion mm -hmm. or movement. He also uh, said he saw this orb of light or light come into him, mm -hmm. and it, you know, transformed him, it changed his whole worldview. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this, this what source of light, or these entities or spirits, um, you know, they define it in one way. Mm -hmm. But how would you proceed or, or define these things or entities? Well, uh, that's what we're going to touch on towards the end of this series. But okay. right now we're trying to establish that we're not talking about obscure, um, you know, people that aren't uh, very well received. Uh, uh, Brian Tracy has taught this to a million people. You know, he's very, very highly regarded. Um, uh, Dean Ornish you know, is very, very uh, highly regarded. You remember earlier all these yeah. newspapers and, and organizations endorsed him? Well, here's another one, John Bradshaw. Th this was something that was more uh, apparent back in the late 80s, early 90s. John Bradshaw uh, was on public television. By the way, public television has been a major uh, promoter of what we're talking about, New Age spirituality. Uh, and this was one of the first individuals that really uh, uh, fit this uh, description. Uh, whenever they have, excuse me, whenever they have pledge drives, they always have kind of uh, experts in certain fields. And uh, um, back in the late 80s, early 90s, Bradshaw was on public television quite often, uh, most likely when they had uh, pledge drives. So, I don't know, uh, I, I'm not familiar, I don't think Canada has public television, but they would, uh, they would show, um, you know, he would dominate uh, entire um, evenings. And then others came after him. Deepak Chopra was on public television. Uh, one of the most prominent ones was a man named Wayne Dyer, who we'll get into later. And uh, he, I think he was on 12 years on public television with their pledge drives. But anyhow, um, this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Uh, John Bradshaw wrote a book called Bradshaw on the Family. And that was, his specialty was uh, family dynamics. And uh, this book became very, very popular in psychology circles and counseling circles. I remember when John Bradshaw spoke, you know, in my area there, uh, huge numbers of people came to see him. You know, he was... Uh, considered a uh, major uh, expert on the family. And again, you know, a lot of his book was, uh, was on, you know, things that were uh, benign or, you know, actually uh, uh, within the realm of, uh, you know, society's uh, traditional views of things. You know, nothing that would be considered offbeat or unusual. But then at the end, at the very end, he had Roadmap for Discovering Your True Self, Spiritual Awakening. And that's where he started to uh, talk about uh, meditation, you know, the codependence is a spiritual problem. And that uh, we need to uh, get higher consciousness. Higher consciousness constitutes the realm of our true self. And that uh, when you're an alpha brainwave consciousness, that's meditation, you have these powers available to you. And he talks about a friend of his that can stick 12-inch uh, uh, knitting needles through his hands and then heal the wounds. And he says that uh, there were also ancient traditions supporting a higher power through expanded consciousness, through the use of meditation. And he says that these highest moments of consciousness, we are one with the universe. And he says, beyond the ego, there is no separation. We are all one. 
And he, he goes on all throughout this, you know, to find our true self, we have to transcend our ordinary ego consciousness. And this constitutes our God-likeness. Again, you know, we are all God. Our true self is our God self. He says, this is crucial. You know, if you don't understand this, you're going to be stuck in your dysfunctional family mode. And he says, as one uh, advances in meditating, a new facility emerges. And it only emerges in silence. And he says, as one advances into the silence, this uh, faculty becomes uh, more and more available. And this is the power of experiencing God. You know, mysticism. Um, spiritual disciplines. Spiritual awakening. Expanded consciousness. So in essence, what... Uh, you know, what I've been talking about here in this, uh, this uh, session is Western society, not just American, but, you know, all over the Western world over the last 30 years has been transformed by uh, these kind of practices and these kind of promotions. And that is why at uh, the mall there, at uh, the major mall in Vancouver, British Columbia, this, uh, the section called Well-Being is saturated with books that promote meditation and that man is divine. And this is the Aquarian Conspiracy.